Die, monster. You don't belong in this world. What? Uh, look, just because I only want to play big budget AAA releases doesn't make me a monster. It makes you worse. There's an abundance of amazing games from smaller publishers just waiting to be explored. Perhaps the same could be said about big publishers as well. Your words are as empty as your soul. Indie games are just as important as big releases. What is an indie game? A miserable little pile of... Indie game. Independent game. Typically a game made on a budget of hopes and dreams and Kickstarter money. But what does this mean for the game? It means that it's going to be a 2D pixel art side scroller. Wait, no, 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 that's wrong. Hold on. Actually, it means that despite the inherent disadvantages that lie with having a smaller budget and team, they actually have one very big advantage. There are no corporate fat cats behind them who are only worried about seeing a significant return on their investment. The developers can now take risks. They have full creative freedom to make whatever the hell they want. And this is what we like to see, because I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm tired. I don't want to play the newest Call of Duty game. I've been playing that shit since I was 10. I don't want to play Assassin's Creed 48, Ezio's butt cheeks. This series has gone on too long. I don't want to play the newest Pokemon game. I've been catching Pokemon since I was six. These tried and true formulas, they work and I'm getting bored of them. So in this video, I picked out some interesting looking indie games and I'm gonna rate them on how unique they are. To me, this shit is my opinion. So without further ado, let's get to the- Stray is a game that recently came out with some gigantic fanfare behind it because it's got three things that gamers around the world just cannot get enough of. Good graphics, cute animals, and an abundance of neon colored lights. In this game, you play as a cat and, and that's where the intrigue lies, see, because in what other game do you get to play as a cat? In what other indie game that came out in 2022 that takes place in a cyberpunk world whose title starts with an S do you get to play as a cat? Exactly. This game is about a cat that may or may not be named Stray, who ends up getting separated from his cat companions. Stray falls to the bottom of this pit and finds themselves in Wall City 99, which was supposed to be a refuge for humans due to an unknown apocalyptic event. But you're not fooling me, game. Unknown apocalyptic event, my ass. I see that blood red moon. There's some bloodborne shit going on here, and I know it. Anyways, spoiler alert all the humans in the city got absolutely ass blasted by a mutated bacteria called the Zerks, uh, which are actually just head crabs from Half Life which are actually just dust mites from the real world. So now we're left with a bunch of robots who take the place of humans and act exactly like a human would act. For example, they wear clothes, which only goes to show that in a society where clothes are technically not even needed, it's always gonna be drip a drown, my friends. There's also our companion B12 who is, spoiler alert, technically the only human in the game. I'm sure there's some deeper meaning you could talk about pertaining to the fact that the only human character in the game is also the least human looking character in the game. But uh, symbolism's for stupid people, so here's a funny video of a cat instead. As for the main objective of this game, it's actually pretty simple to be honest. You're just trying to escape the city. And we're also trying to save the sentient robots of the city by opening up the ceiling of the walled city, which will allow sunlight into the city and kill all the zerks. But uh, if you ask me, we're only doing this because it's on the way to the exit door. Now let me restate this. In this game, you play as a cat, right? So what are cats best known for? Being a bunch of dickheads. Luckily, this game gives you plenty of opportunity to be a dickhead. You could scratch up sofas, floors, and walls, you could push things off of tables, you could just, in general, be a nuisance to everybody around you. The game even gives you a meow button so you could be annoying in cutscenes as well. And on the off chance you are wondering, the cat doesn't have balls. You know, I think those Red Dead horse ball physics might have spoiled me a bit, but it's a next gen game, so you know, am I really wrong to think that there should have been some cat balls in this game, you know? Just think about it. How about we talk more about the gameplay though? See, this game is mostly about exploration. The pretty graphics are a make or break point for this game, and if you don't really care about exploring a cyberpunk city from the perspective of a quadruped, and not doing much else than that, then this game probably isn't for you. There are some puzzles and chase sequences here and there, but unless you have the motor and cognitive functions of a three-year-old, you probably won't have any trouble with these. And I mean, even the jumping is made easy, you know, cause lord forbid we have to actually put forth a modicum of effort in this video game. 
There's a button prompt for every jump, so you can only really go where the game wants you to go. And I can understand the developer's vision for wanting this game to just be about soaking in the atmosphere and the story, but I do think this was a big sell by the developers, as there could have been some very fun platforming segments in this game. Or should I say, there could have been some very fun catforming segments in this game. <laughs> oh! Oh. I use jokes as a coping mechanism for my deep-seated insecurities. On a unique scale, this is probably like a 2 out of 5, and overall this is probably like a 6 out of 10. On paper, there are not a lot of games that match Stray's description, but when you play it, you're probably not going to be thinking to yourself that this is the type of experience you've never had in a game before. If I had to describe this game in a few words, it would probably be an animal-based exploration game with diet platforming. The Outer Wilds is a game about space. But it's not to be confused with The Outer Worlds, which is also a game about space. Alright, side note here, but call, call me crazy, I think this little naming mishap was on purpose. See, two games that came out in the same year with the same naming scheme, both taking place in space, and, and guess, what, guess what else happened in 2019? The United States Space Force was founded. See, yeah, I'm not saying this is some giant psyop to get you to join the US Space Force, but... That's actually exactly what I'm saying. <clears throat> uh, the, the Outer Wilds is a game made by Mobius Digital in 2019. And now, now let me say this. this. This game is at its best when you know absolutely nothing about it going into it. So if you haven't played this game, and I do recommend playing this game, skip this part in the video and then come back after you've played it. That is, if you even really care about what I have to say about it, you know, maybe you, you or maybe you don't, you know, don't come back. I, see if I care. As I said, The Outer Worlds... Oh shit, even I'm doing it. As I said, The Outer Wilds is a game about space. Now when you think of space games, you think of hundreds of planets you can explore, interesting aliens you can interact with and potentially fight, or space battles, and, uh, and maybe space pirates. Arg. Well, in The Outer Wilds, there's like six-ish planets, and no space battles, no space pirates, like a handful of NPCs, no real space creatures, and the main gameplay loop revolves around you reading intergalactic text messages off of walls. This is the best space game I've ever played. Now the Outer Wilds employs a tactic that I've been seeing used quite a lot recently in games, where you only really get a small inhale, a little whiff of where you're supposed to be going, and then the game lets you figure everything else out on your own. At the very beginning of the game, you wake up next to a campfire. Now your first instinct is probably going to be to toast a couple marshmallows, but after that, you're going to talk to this guy. Hey, so, uh, what am I doing here exactly? What do you mean, what are you doing here? You're going on a space expedition. I've been building this ship for months. Don't tell me you got cold feet now. A space expedition? Uh, what am I, what am I going to space for? What am I? You're the one going to space. What the hell are you asking me for? So you hop in your ship, go out and start exploring this solar system with no real purpose in mind. You see a planet you like, you land on it, and you take your first steps out. <laughs> you silly bitch, you forgot to wear a spacesuit. That's game over for you. But actually it's not, because you wake up next to the same campfire you woke up to at the very beginning of the game. So you talk to the same NPC once more. Did... did I just die? Yeah, you got brain damage or something there, chief? Because you can't pilot a ship with brain damage. Brain damage? No, 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 no. I'm fairly certain I just died. Right. Let me level with you here, brother. See, if you're dead and talking to me, that means I'm dead. And do I look like a dead man to you? Now get your dumbass in the ship. And he makes a convincing argument, so you hop into your ship once again. This time, you don't forget to wear the only means of protection you have against the cold, unforgiving reaches of space, and you find yourselves in the remains of a civilization, the Noami, who at one point colonized this entire solar system. You explore around a bit, learning what happened to them in... What is going on outside? Yeah, fuel level critical. I could see that. D did the sun just explode? You once again wake up in the same place that you started in, and it's quite clear to you now that you're in a time loop. 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 
Every time you die, you'll respawn in the same location, and if you somehow manage to not kill yourself in 22 minutes, then the sun will go supernova and wipe you out anyways. And you have a sneaking suspicion that this might be related to the Noami who had previously inhabited this solar system. So now you have an objective. Travel from location to location and observe the remnants of the Noami in order to slowly piece together why the time loop is happening, why the Noami have disappeared, and how you can put a stop to it. The information you gather between your deaths remains in your ship log and one clue leads to another. You're kind of like Sherlock Holmes, but instead of trying to figure out who killed somebody at a dinner party, you're trying to figure out why you're stuck in a 22 minute time loop where you and everyone you know gets killed in a fiery cosmic explosion. As for the gameplay, it's 100% navigation based. The movement of your ship in space handles pretty much like how it should in real life. Uh, now I say this as somebody who's never even touched a spaceship in his entire life, but I can guarantee that this is probably how it would, this, no this is, this is it, this is it. The challenge of navigating a character on your ship always felt engaging to me, and you really end up seeing a sort of progression in your skill at it. See, when I first started, I was terrible at it. Shaking like a crackhead with no crack, you know, I was crashing into everything, dying constantly. But by the end of the game, I felt like a crackhead with crack. Um, I felt like an astronaut, like a, like a Buzz Lightyear sort of fellow. Now, as a game that is solely about exploring, you need some great locations to explore, right? What the game lacks in quantity of places to explore, 100% makes up for it with the quality. Every area you explore here is so unique it puts other space games to shame. See, there's your home planet, which is pretty much the Earth of the solar system, you know, boring, right? But you take a step out and there are places like Giant's Deep, which is a planet that's one big ocean with a bunch of tornadoes flying around it. Or Brittle Hollow, a planet that literally has a black hole inside of it that's slowly tearing the planet apart. Or the Hourglass Twins, which are actually two planets so close to each other that one of the planet's gravity is causing the sand from the other planet to get sucked away. Or Dark Bramble, a planet that literally acts as a pocket dimension and the whole thing is shrouded in fog and... Oh my god, that's terrifying. That's Holy shit. No, 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 no. I feel like now is a good point for me to make my case about why this is actually half of a horror game. See, now this isn't your typical scary ghost story or zombie bullshit. See, this is that deep existential cosmic horror. Because there is actually one horror section of the game where you had to stealth your way around this foggy ass planet unless you want to be one hit killed by these giant space anglerfish which have no right to be as scary as they actually are. But besides that, you wouldn't think that anything in this game would evoke a real sense of dread. However, this game does a real good job of making you feel insignificant and helpless. The cold ridges of space can be unforgiving and honestly made me feel more of a sense of anxiety exploring some of these locations than I've felt in a lot of other horror games I've played. I've never really had a fear of deep space, but as you're floating away from any signs of life, completely helpless, watching your vitals go down, everything slowly gets darker around you. There's no reset button, so you just have to wait until your oxygen runs out. Your character's breathing slowly gets more and more unsteady. And it's in this moment that you finally realize. They should have put some balls on that cat. Anyways, The Outer Wilds is like a, it's like a, a 4 out of 5 on the uniqueness scale and a 9 out of 10 overall. Atmospheric puzzle solving isn't technically a new genre, but when you factor in things like the soundtrack, the world, the environments, and the gameplay, man, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find many games that can deliver an experience that's quite like The Outer Wilds. If I had to describe this game, it would be a space-based homes-like with a sprinkle of cosmic horror. Minute is actually not a joke about me in bed, rather it's a game that came out in 2018 published by Devolver Digital. The premise is you only have one minute to live before you die and get sent back to a respawn point. But hey, I mean shit, you know, you can, you can get a lot done in a minute really. A minute's a long time actually. And, and you know, some people, some people might actually say it's too long. You know, it's too long of a time. And, and it isn't about how like long, you know, how long it goes, it's kind of more about like how, how meaningful and, and you know, it's a passionate minute. Anyways, I should probably stick to the theme here, so this section is only going to be a minute long. As I said, Minute is a game where you only have a minute to live before you get sent back to a restart point, so every single life feels like a speedrun to get as much done as possible in that one single minute. The story of the game is fairly straightforward, see? You find a cursed sword on the ground and pick it up, which is the cause of your minute curse, and you soon find out that the sword is actually a product of the sword factory, and there there are millions of cursed swords being mass produced, so your mission is to use this sword to help you get to the sword factory and reverse this curse by beating the boss, who is a giant sword. Oh. Alright, I, I see what this is. I get it. But it's not going to be as easy as you think it'll be, because you'll have to solve puzzles and defeat enemies all within this one minute constraint. This is a game about progression, because every time you respawn you'll be armed with the knowledge of areas, enemies, or paths that you didn't have on your previous runs, but to gain all of this knowledge you'll have to die. A, a whole lot, you'll be dying constantly. No, this is dead ass going to kill me. This is seriously, I'm going to be here till I die. 
This game makes a lot of meta jokes and employs that typical indie game of surgist humor. It was funny and entertaining, albeit fairly short. I beat the game in about two hours, but there is a new game plus mode where you only have 40 seconds to live instead of a minute. GO! YOU PIECE OF SHIT! TALK FASTER! WHAT IS THIS?! Jazz punk in a single word is absurd. Jazz punk in two words is jazz punk. I struggle to describe the experience I had playing jazz punk. Not because this is some deep philosophical piece of art that words cannot properly describe, uh, but rather because the sheer amount of dumb shit in this game has turned my brain into TV static. Now let's get this out of the way, see? If your definition of a story is an account of events in an interrelated sequence, then this game doesn't really have a story. But if your definition of a story is things happen, then you're probably gonna like this one. The game takes place in Japanada in the 1950s Cold War era, and you're a spy who goes on a series of missions that are given to you by your director, in which you do typical James Bond-esque spy-like activities, like uh, that one minigame from Street Fighter, or shaving a man's chest with a weed whacker, or playing a riveting game of Twister. Now if what I just said sounds like a Mad Lib to you, then I don't blame you. To be honest, I'm pretty sure that's how the devs made this game. This shit is completely random most of the time, it's all over the place. I mean, it, this game feels like a deep dive into the mind of a man with severe ADHD. It doesn't even make sense how you get from one place to another most of the time. And, and you know, what is, uh, oh, oh, it's Tony Hawk now. Um, Tony Hawk, uh, Pro Skater 1 and 2 has always been uh, a, a great game and they remastered it, you know, for the for the, the new systems. And I've always been a big Tony Hawk fan, you know. The gameplay is best described as a series of interactive gags. And to be honest, you don't really have to see most of these gags to beat the game, but you probably want to. So you could go directly do the mission, but then you'd miss out on this wrestling match with Hulk Hogan. <laughs> oh. I am the cream of the wheat. So you could follow the director's orders and do the mission, but then who's gonna murder this man with a swarm of pigeons? Now you could go ahead and do the mission, but then who's gonna- Oh shit, we're doing this again. Um, a, a Tony Hawk American Wasteland has always been one of my favorite uh, Tony Hawk games because you could, uh, you, the, the kick flips were smooth and, the, and you could, um, you could smash things and, you know, but honestly, I always liked Underground back in the day. That was, that was always my game. For some reason, the game decided that throughout random areas in each level, there's gonna be random music playing, which doesn't sound like a bad thing until you actually hear the music that is playing. I mean, listen to this. What is this? some like form of psychological torture. Also, I might as well touch on the game's voice acting. Uh, real, real good stuff here. I got a partition, goes like this. Diddle bop, diddle bop, doop bop, doop bop, doop. I got some upcoming gigs. Almost a terabyte. And you know, earlier I said the game doesn't have much of a story. Well, I mean, yeah, but I'll go ahead and walk you through what's there anyways. The game starts with us being shipped to our headquarters in a suitcase. When we arrive, we talk to our director who tells us that our first mission is to infiltrate the Soviet consulate to, um, like, uh, steal, steal some data or something. I, I don't know. We stealthily make our way to the top of the Soviet consulate to find the key to the data in a cereal box. We use the key to get the data and then we escape. After we do that, our next mission is to steal the kidney from a cowboy in a sushi restaurant. And we do this by collecting enough spiders to get into the kitchen, so we can poison the cowboy's food and make him shit out his kidney. After that mission though, the director tells us that we should lay low and take a vacation because we attracted some unwanted attention. So we go to the Kai Tak Resort, but while we're there we learn that the villain of the story, who's named The Editor, is also at this resort. So we dress in drag to steal his briefcase, however we end up getting drugged. When we wake up, we actually find out that we're in a... So in order to get out, we beat a mechanical pig with a ukulele. After we escape the Matrix, we find out that the director has been taken hostage by the editor. And for all of the reasons I have just stated, that is why Tony Hawk Project 8 single-handedly caused the 2008 financial crisis. It's probably like an 8.5 out of 10. And so to get him out, we must play the editor in a, a handful of mini-games, like racing sauce boats in a gravy river, or playing a game of tennis on the Virtual Boy. Uh, we end up losing though, but turns out the editor has a giant ego, 
So we inflate his ego enough to pop him like a balloon, and then the game ends with this. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let this one play out. They've got me suspended in some sort of a whiskey, high quality whiskey. Sorry, old Sam, but a croc's gotta do what a croc's gotta do. I mean, you might as well crawl in my mouth now because it's only gonna end one way. Uniqueness is a 5 out of 5, and overall this game is a 7 out of 10 to me. I, I don't really think I've ever played a game quite like this in my entire life, and I don't know if I ever really want to again. The jokes were funny, and overall I enjoyed the 5-ish hours it took for me to beat this game, but I feel like the novelty of this might wear off if it was done a second time. If I had to describe this game, it would be an LSD-induced series of jokes with an almost coherent story. Amori is an indie 2D turn-based anti-RPG about mental health that is heavily inspired by Earthbound. I'm not talking to you, Undertale. This is a different game. I've already given an extra spoiler warning for one of the games in this video, so I feel like it's only right for me to give it for this one as well. Because if there's one game that I've talked about today that you should definitely go play, it's this one. And I will be spoiling shit. The game is only like $20 on Steam, so if a surreal classic RPG with an amazing story piques your interest at all, then don't watch this and go play the game. And if it doesn't, or you're still on the fence, I don't know, stick around, I guess. Anyways, Amori is a serious game, okay? See, this is a game about depression, and accepting yourself, and overcoming trauma, and moving on, alright? So, so no jokes in this part of the video, you're not gonna hear a quip, a jest, or a josh out of me. Why did the Scarecrow win an award? Because he was outstanding in his field! <laughs> He's a, he's a scarecrow, he stands in fields all day. Amori is about a boy named Amori. Well, he's actually named Sunny, but in his dream world, he's named Amori, which is short for Hikikomori, the Japanese word for shut-in, or neat, or somebody who never sees the light of day, and also, ironically, describes Sunny. See, because it's the name, it's clever. It gets better, guys, hold on. The game starts in what's called the white space, I think a better name for it is the Cope Room, because it's a room in Sonny's cognition that he uses as an escape from his problems, and it's also the place where Sonny becomes Amori. And this room is filled with the essentials of what a man needs. A computer, and a box of tissues. And a, and a journal filled with some questionable drawings, we'll just gloss over those. We pick up a knife that'll be our main tool in combat for the rest of this game, and then take a step through this white door. We're greeted by a colorful room where our friends Aubrey, Kel, and Hero are waiting, and we as the player will get to know these characters much better throughout the rest of the game. We leave this room and step out into the headspace, which is another name for Sunny's dream world. We meet another one of Sunny's friends named Basil, as well as Mari, who is actually Sunny's sister, and we play a game of hide and seek with the children in the park. After a fun game with everybody, we take a nice stroll to Basil's house, and on the way we kill a couple of innocent forest creatures. When we get there, we look at a scrapbook filled with memories of Sonny and his friends having fun, and I mean, <laughs> look at these guys, they're, they're having so much fun, and you know, for a game about depression and stuff, you know, this kind of seems just like a light-hearted adventure, and... Well, we're back in the white space, but there's no door this time. No escape. But there is now a stab option. Uh, who are we stabbing, though? Oh, myself. That's cool. And then Sunny wakes up. See, you don't just play in the headspace. Half of this game also takes place in the real world. And in the real world, things are a little different. They suck. Here we learn that we're currently home alone because our parents are setting up a new house that we're moving into. In fact, we only have about three days left before we end up moving away from our childhood home. And we also learn that we haven't talked to any of our friends in real life in about four years, so maybe we should see them again. We hear a knocking on the door downstairs. But as we go down the stairs, we get stopped by... something. That's not me being vague, that, that's actually its name. We manage to get away by calming down. There's still a knocking at the door though, so we go to check it. Oh, would you look at that, it's our sister. Let's just, uh, uh, we, can, we can just go back to bed. We are back in the white space. We leave and return to Basil's house to find out that he's actually been taken by... something. Again, that's actually its name. 
And now we have our objectives. In the headspace, our objective is to find Basil, and in real life, our objective is to reconcile with our friends. There is a uh, one pressing question though. Uh, what exactly are we escaping from? Why haven't we talked to our friends in four years? Why are we depressed? Why have we shut ourselves away from the world? Well, it's because our sister Mari is actually dead in the real world. She took her life four years ago. Anyways, here's this. What the hell is this? Yeah, the stark contrast between the game worlds was always funny to me. See, the surreal comedic nature in the headspace always clashed with the more toned down and serious sections in the real world, or even the straight up psychological horror portions of the game. I mean, sure, you know, life is depressing, and people die, and friendships fall apart, but when, when that funny hamster eats cheese, man, I, I really feel like all might be right with the world. And I'm not saying that these things clashed in a negative way either, I mean, the difference strengthens the story in my opinion, because not only did they do a real good job personifying the dread and despair that can be found in the hearts and minds of the mentally unwell, but that quirked up humor employed throughout the entire game was also top notch as well. All these lighthearted and funny moments we experienced with our friends just made me get more emotionally attached to these characters and their story. Sonny's recollection of his friends in the headspace are all from four years ago. So what you're seeing is how much fun everyone was having together before Mari died. And when you see how different everything is currently in the real world, it just hits you twice as hard. A wise man once said, Same, same things, things make us, us laugh, make, make us cry. Honestly, it's been a real long time since I've played any game that's made me feel so emotionally attached to the characters in it. And you know, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I may have shed a few manly male tears in this game. Wait, hold, hold on. There was a section of this game that I weeped. Not like full on bawling, but you know, I was choking up. And I won't say when, but if you've played this game, you more than likely know when. The music in this game is some heat though. I mean, they knocked it out of the goddamn park with this soundtrack. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Woo. Oh my goodness. That is a, that is a beach right there. <laughs> Let's talk about the combat though, see this game is a turn-based RPG, and I know a lot of people have a lot of things to say about turn-based combat, you know, some people say hey this shit is boring, and some people live and die by it. I for one err on the side of enjoying it. And no I'm not saying that because turn-based combat is holding my family hostage, I'm saying that because I was actually gaslighted into liking it by the sheer amount of JRPGs I've played. The weird spin they add onto this one is the emotion system, which pretty much acts like a mini game of rock, paper, scissors. Angry beats sad, sad beats happy, and happy beats angry. So you always want to be what your opponent isn't. The combat also serves as a storytelling device in some of the most important sections of the game because it allows you to, in real time, overcome the burdens and fears that are troubling Sunny. You really do be throwing hands with depression. The combat isn't really too challenging, or even necessarily the most impressive rendition of a turn-based combat system I've seen but I never really felt bored of it, and that could probably be attributed to the number of interesting enemies you fight in this game. Speaking of interesting though, the, uh, the headspace. I mentioned once that it was surreal, but it really does feel like the world of a child with an overactive imagination. Interesting locations and places that are as weird and wacky as they are somber. You'll see things in the real world, and then you'll see them once again in the headspace, but this time you'll see them filtered through the lens of an emotionally stunted teenager with too much time to think. But you know what I think? I think this game is a goddamn 10 out of 10. <laughs> As far as being unique, I'd only give it like a 3 out of 5 though. There are other games that have done similar things and hit similar beats, but that being said, I don't think any other game like this has pulled me in quite as much as Amori did. If I had to describe this game, it would be a surreal, tragic comedy, psychological horror RPG. So that's it. I'll, uh, I'll keep this outro short and sweet. Here's what the damage is looking like. Alright, and since the tier list at the end of my previous video went over so well, uh, here's one for the road. A tier list of fast food restaurants. Okay, bye-bye.